Section 18 of Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 1st March 1645. At the Greek church we saw the Eastern ceremonies performed by a bishop, etc., in that tongue. Here the unfortunate Duke and Duchess of Bouillon received their ashes, it being the first day of Lent. There was now as much trudging up and down of devotees as the day before of licentious people, all saints alike to appearance. The gardens of Justinian, which we next visited, are very full of statues and antiquities, especially urns, among which is that of Minutius Felix, a terminus that formerly stood in the Appian Way, and a huge colossae of the Emperor Justinian. There is a delicate aviary on the hill. The whole garden is furnished with rare collections, fresh, shady and adorned with noble fountains. Continuing our walk a mile farther, we came to Pons Milvius, now Mella, where Constantine overthrew Maxentius and saw the miraculous sign of the cross in hoc signo vinces. It was a sweet morning and the bushes were full of nightingales. Hence to Aqua Claudia again, an aqueduct finished by that emperor at the expense of eight millions. In the afternoon to Farnese's gardens near the Campo Vaccino and upon the Palatine Mount to survey the ruins of Juno's temple in the Piscina, a piazza so called near the famous bridge built by Antoninus Pius and re-edified by Pope Sextus IV. The rest of this week we went to the Vatican to hear the sermons at St. Peter's of the most famous preachers who discourse on the same subjects and texts yearly, full of Italian eloquence and action. On Our Lady Day, 25th March, we saw the Pope and Cardinals ride in pomp to the Minerva, the great guns of the Castle of San Angelo being fired when he gives portions to 500 Citella young women who kiss his feet in procession, some destined to marry, some to be nuns, the scholars of the college celebrating the Blessed Virgin with their compositions. The next day His Holiness was busied in blessing golden roses to be sent to several great princes, the procurator of the Carmelites preaching on our saviours feeding the multitude with five loaves, the ceremony ends. The sacrament being this day exposed, and the relics of the Holy Cross, the concourse about the streets is extraordinary. On Palm Sunday there was a great procession, after a papal mass. 11th April 1645. St. Veronica's handkerchief, with the impression of our Saviour's face, was exposed, and the next day the spear, with a world of ceremony. On Holy Thursday, the Pope said Mass, and afterward carried the host in procession about the chapel with an infinity of tapers. This finished, His Holiness was carried in his open chair on men's shoulders to the place where, reading the bull in Queen Domini, he both curses and blesses all in a breath. Then the guns are again fired. Hence he went to the Ducal Hall of the Vatican, where he washed the feet of twelve poor men, with almost the same ceremony as it is done at White Hall. They have clothes, a dinner and arms, which he gives with his own hands, and serves at their table. They have also gold and silver medals, but their garments are of white woollen long robes, as we paint the apostles. The same ceremonies are done by the conservators and other officers of state at St. John de Lateran. And now the table on which they say our blessed Lord celebrated his last supper is set out, and the heads of the apostles. In every famous church they are busy in dressing up their pageantries to represent the Holy Sepulchre, of which we went to visit divers. On Good Friday we went again to St. Peter's, where the handkerchief, lance and cross were all exposed and worshipped together. All the confession seats were filled with devout people, 
and at night was the procession of several who most lamentably whipped themselves till their blood stained their clothes, for some had shirts, others upon the pair back, having visors and masks on their faces. At every three or four steps, dashing the knotted and raveled whip cord over their shoulders as hard as they could lay it on, while some of the religious orders and fraternities sung in a dismal tone the lights and crosses going before, making altogether a horrible and indeed heathenish pomp. The next day there was much ceremony at St John de Laterano, so as the whole week was spent in running from church to church, in the town in busy devotion, great silence and unimaginable superstition. Easter Day. I was awakened by the guns from St. Angelo. We went to St. Peter's, where the Pope himself celebrated Mass, showed the relics before named, and gave a public benediction. Monday we went to hear music in the Chiesa Nova, and though there were abundance of ceremonies at the other great churches, and great exposure of relics, yet being wearied with sights of this nature, and the season of the year, summer, at Rome being very dangerous by reason of the heat minding us of returning northward, we spent the rest of our time in visiting such places as we had not yet sufficiently seen. Only I do not forget the Pope's benediction of the gonfalone, or standard, and giving the hallowed palms, and on May Day the great procession of the university and the muleteers at St Antony's, and their setting up a foolish maypole in the capital, very ridiculous. We therefore now took coach a little out of town to visit the famous Roma Soterania, being much like what we have seen at St Sebastian's. Here in a cornfield, guided by two torches, we crept on our bellies into a little hole, about twenty paces, which delivered us into a large entry that led us into several streets or alleys, a good depth in the bowels of the earth, a strange and fearful passage for diverse miles, as Bozio has measured and described them in his book. We ever and anon came into pretty square rooms that seemed to be chapels with altars, and some adorned with very ordinary ancient painting. Many skeletons and bodies are placed on the sides, one above the other, in degrees like shelves, whereof some are shut up with a coarse flat stone, having engraven on them pro Christo, or a cross and palms, which are supposed to have been martyrs. Here in all likelihood were the meetings of the primitive Christians during the persecutions, as Pliny the Younger describes them. As I was prying about, I found a glass phial, filled, as was conjectured, with dried blood and two lacrimatories. Many of the bodies, or rather bones, for there appeared nothing else, lay so entire as if placed by the art of the chirurgian, but being only touched, fell all to dust. Thus, after wandering two or three miles in this subterranean meander, we returned almost blind when we came into the daylight, and even choked by the smoke of the torches. It is said that a French bishop and his retinue, adventuring too far into these dens, their lights going out, were never heard of more. We were entertained at night with an English play at the Jesuits, where we before had dined, and the next day at Prince Gallicano's, who himself composed the music to a magnificent opera, where were present Cardinal Pamphilio, the Pope's nephew, the governors of Rome, the cardinals, the ambassadors, ladies, and a number of nobility and strangers. There had been in the morning a joust and tournament of several young gentlemen on a formal defy to which we had been invited, the prizes being distributed by the ladies after the nine errantry way. The lancers and swordsmen running our tilt against the barriers with a great deal of clatter, but without any bloodshed giving much diversion to the spectators, and was new to us travellers. The next day Mr Henshaw and I spent the morning in attending the entrance and cavalcade of Cardinal Medici, the ambassador from the Grand Duke of Florence, by the Via Flaminia. After dinner we went again to the Villa Borghese, about a mile without the city, 
The garden is rather a park or a paradise, contrived and planted with walks and shades of myrtles, cypress and other trees and groves, with abundance of fountains, statues and bas relievos, and several pretty murmuring rivulets. Here they hung large nets to catch woodcocks. There was also a vivary where, among other exotic fowls, was an ostrich. Besides a most capacious aviary, and in another enclosed part, a herd of deer. Before the palace, which might become the court of a great prince, stands a noble fountain of white marble, enriched with statues. The outer walls of the house are encrusted with excellent antique bas-relievos of the same marble, in cornish with festoons and niches set with statues from the foundation to the roof. A stately portico joins the palace, full of statues and columns of marbles, urns and other curiosities of sculpture. In the first hall were the twelve Caesars of antique marble and the whole apartments furnished with pictures of the most celebrated masters, and two rare tables of porphyry of great value. But of this already, for I often visited this delicious place. This night were glorious fireworks at the palace of Cardinal Medici before the gate, and lights of several colours all about the windows through the city, which they contrived by setting the candles in little paper lanterns, dyed with various colours, placing hundreds of them from story to story, which renders a gallant show. 4th May 1645 Having seen the entry of the Ambassador of Luca, I went to the Vatican, where by favour of our Cardinal Protector Francesco Barberini, I was admitted into the consistory, heard the Ambassador make his oration in Latin to the Pope, sitting on an elevated state or throne, and changing two pontifical mitres. After which I was presented to kiss his toe, that is, his embroidered slipper, two cardinals holding up his vest and surplice, and then being sufficiently blessed with his thumb and two fingers for that day, I returned home to dinner. We went again to see the medals of Signor Gottofredi, which were absolutely the best collection in Rome. Passing the Ludovisia Villa, where the petrified human figure lies, found on the snowy Alps, I measured the hydra and found it not a foot long. The three necks and fifteen heads seemed to be but patched up with several pieces of serpent skins. 5th May 1645. We took coach and went fifteen miles out of the city to Frascati, formerly Tusculum, a villa of Cardinal Aldo Brandini, built for a country house, but surpassing, in my opinion, the most delicious places I ever beheld, for its situation, elegance, plentiful water, groves, ascents and prospects. Just behind the palace, which is of excellent architecture, in the centre of the enclosure, rises a high hill or mountain, all over clad with tall wood, and so formed by nature, as if it had been cut out by art, from the summit whereof falls a cascade, seeming rather a great river than a stream, precipitating into a large theatre of water, representing an exact and perfect rainbow when the sun shines out. Under this is made an artificial grot, wherein are curious rocks, hydraulic organs, and all sorts of singing birds, moving and chirping by force of the water, with several other pageants and surprising inventions. In the centre of one of these rooms rises a copper ball that continually dances about three feet above the pavement, by virtue of a wind conveyed secretly to a hole beneath it, with many other devices to wet the unwary spectators so that one can hardly step without wetting to the skin. In one of these theatres of water is an atlas spouting up the stream to a very great height, and another monster makes a terrible roaring with a horn. But above all, the representation of a storm is most natural, with such fury of rain, wind and thunder as one would imagine oneself in some extreme tempest. The garden has excellent walks and shady groves, abundance of rare fruit, oranges, lemons, etc., 
and the goodly prospect of Rome above all description, so as I do not wonder that Cicero and others have celebrated this place with such encomiums. The palace is indeed built more like a cabinet than anything composed of stone and mortar. It has in the middle of a hall furnished with excellent marbles and rare pictures, especially those of Giuseppino d'Arpino. The movables are princely and rich. This was the last piece of architecture finished by Giacomo della Pocta, who built it for Pietro Cardinal Aldo Brandini in the time of Clement VIII. We went hence to another house and garden not far distant, on the side of a hill called Mondragone, finished by Cardinal Scipio Borghese, an ample and kingly edifice. It has a very long gallery, and at the end a theatre for pastimes, spacious courts, rare grots, vineyards, olive grounds, groves and solitudes. The air is so fresh and sweet as few parts of Italy exceed it, nor is it inferior to any palace in the city itself for statues, pictures and furniture. But, it growing late, we could not take such particular notice of these things as they deserved. Tivoli 6th May 1645 We rested ourselves, and next day, in a coach, took our last farewell of visiting the circumjacent places, going to Tivoli, or the old Tibertum. At about six miles from Rome, we passed the Teverone, a bridge built by Mamea, the mother of Severus, and so by diverse ancient sepulchres, among others that of Valerius Voluzzi, and near it passed the stinking sulphurous river over the Ponte Lucano, where we found a heap or turret full of inscriptions, now called the tomb of Plautius. Arrived at Tivoli, we went first to see the Palace d'Este, erected on a plain, but where was formerly a hill. The palace is very ample and stately. In the garden, on the right hand, are sixteen vast conchers of marble, jetting out waters. In the midst of these stands a Janus quadrifons that cast forth four girandolas, called from the resemblance, to a particular exhibition in fireworks so named, the Fontana di Specco, looking glass. Near this is a place for tilting. Before the ascent of the palace is the famous fountain of Leda, and not far from that four sweet and delicious gardens. Descending thence are two pyramids of water, and in a grove of trees near it, the fountains of Tethys, Esculapius, Arethusa, Pandora, Pomona and Flora. Then the prancing Pegasus, Bacchus, the Grot of Venus, the two Colosses of Melicata and Sibylla Tiburtina, all of exquisite marble, copper and other suitable adornments. The cupids pouring out water are especially most rare, and the urns on which are placed the ten nymphs. The grops are richly paved with pietra comessa, shells, coral, etc. Toward Roma Triumphans leads a long and spacious walk, full of fountains, under which is historized the whole of Idiom Metamorphosis in rarely sculptured mezzo relievo. At the end of this, next the wall, is the city of Rome, as it was in its beauty, of small models representing that city, with its amphitheatres, now marquee, termi, temples, arches, aqueducts, streaks and other magnificences, with a little stream running through it for the Tiber, gushing out of an urn next to the statue of the river. In another garden is a noble aviary, the birds artificial, and singing till an owl appears, on which they suddenly change their notes. Near this is the fountain of dragons, casting out large streams of water with great noise. In another grotto, called Grotto di Natura, is a hydraulic organ, and below this are diverse stews and fish ponds, in one of which is the statue of Neptune in his chariot on a seahorse, in another a triton, and lastly a garden of simples. There are besides in the palace many rare statues and pictures, bedsteads richly inlaid, and sundry other precious movables. The whole is said to have cost the best part of a million. Having gratified our curiosity with these artificial miracles, and dined, 
we went to see the so famous natural precipice and cascade of the river Anio, rushing down from the mountains of Tivoli, with that fury that, what with the mist it perpetually casts up by the breaking of the water against the rocks, and what with the sun shining on it and forming a natural iris, and the prodigious depth of the gulf below, it is enough to astonish one that looks on it. Upon the summit of this rock stands the ruins and some pillars and cornices of the temple of Sibylla Tilbertina or Albunea, a round fabric still discovering some of its pristine beauty. Here was a great deal of gunpowder drying in the sun, and a little beneath mills belonging to the Pope. Rome. And now we return to Rome. By the way, we were showed at some distance the city Preneste and the Hadrian Villa, now only a heap of ruins, and so came late to our lodging. We now determined to desist from visiting any more curiosities except what should happen to come in our way, when my companion Mr. Henshaw, or myself, should go to take the air. Only I may not omit that one afternoon, diverting ourselves in the Piazza Navona, a mountebank there, to allure curious strangers, taking off a ring from his finger, which seemed set with a dull dark stone, a little swelling out like what we call, though untruly, a toadstone, and wetting his finger a little in his mouth, and then touching it, it emitted a lucent flame, as bright and large as a small wax candle, then, blowing it out, repeated this several times. I have much regretted that I did not purchase receipt of him for making that composition at what price soever, for though there is a process in Johannes Baptista Porta and others how to do it, yet on several trials they none of them have succeeded. Among other observations I made in Rome are these, as to coins and medals, ten asses make the Roman denarius, five the quinarius, ten denarii and aureus, which a compte runs almost exactly with what is now in use of quadrini, baiots, Julius and Scudi, each exceeding the other in the proportion of ten. The Sestertius was a small silver coin, marked HS, or rather LL, valued two pounds and a half of silver, viz. 250 denarii, about 25 golden ducati. The stamp of the Roman denarius varied, having sometimes a Janus Bifrons, the head of Roma armed, or with a chariot and two horses, which were called Bigi, if with four, Quadrigi, if with a Victoria, so name. The mark of the Denarius was distinguished thus, or X, the Quinarius of half value had on one side the head of Rome, and V, the reverse Castor and Pollux on horseback, inscribed Roma, etc. I observed that in the Greek church they made the sign of the cross from the right hand to the left, contrary to the Latins and the schismatic Greeks, gave the benediction with the first, second and little finger stretched out, retaining the third bent down, expressing a distance of the third person of the Holy Trinity from the first two. For sculptors and architects, we found Bernini and Algardi were in the greatest esteem. Fiammingo as a statuary, who made the Andrew in St. Peter's and is said to have died mad because it was placed in an ill light. Among the painters, Antonio de la Cornia, who has such an address of counterfeiting the hands of the ancient masters so well as to make his copies pass for originals, Pietro da Cortone, Monsieur Poussin, a Frenchman, and innumerable more, Fioravanti for armour, plate, dead life, tapestry, etc., the chief masters of music, after Marc Antonio the best treble, is Cavalier Loretto, an eunuch. The next Cardinal Beach's eunuch, Bianchi Tenor, and Nicolai Bass. The Jews in Rome wore red hats, till the Cardinal of Lyon, being short-sighted, lately saluted one of them, thinking him to be a Cardinal as he passed by his coach, on which an order was made that they should use only the yellow colour. There was now at Rome one Mrs. Ward, an English devotee, who much solicited for an order of Jesuitesses. 
At executions I saw one, a gentleman, hanged in his cloak and hat for murder. They struck the malefactor with a club that first stunned him and then cut his throat. At Naples they use a frame like ours at Halifax. It is reported that Rome has been once no less than fifty miles in compass, now not thirteen, containing in it three thousand churches and chapels, monasteries, etc. It is divided into fourteen regions or wards, has seven mountains and as many campi or valleys. In these are fair parks or gardens called villas, being only places of recess and pleasure, at some distance from the streets, yet within the walls. The bills of exchange I took up from my first entering Italy till I went from Rome, amounting to but 616 Ducati di Banco, though I purchased many books, pictures and curiosities. End of section 18